Hi, this video lecture is on the Ralph Waldo Emerson readings and American transcendentalism for the course English 345 in the fall of 2022. The slide deck also contains poetry by William Cullen Bryant. It's possible depending on how the time goes on the Tuesday of this week. It's possible that some of these slides will have already been talked about in class, but to make a clean break, I wanted to begin here with Emerson. So Ralph Waldo Emerson, for some reason, we always call him by all three names, first, middle, and last. Emerson was what is called a transcendentalist. You can see here on the slide, the words American transcendentalism. It is a bit of a mouthful. I'll tell you that transcendentalism is one of the most famous movements in American literary history. You can look up transcendentalism online and find many, many websites, YouTube videos, all sorts of information. Emerson's writing is not easy to read. It is filled with many allusions. It is highly intertextual, meaning it refers to a number of different texts, historical, um, classical, all sorts of different uh, readings that Emerson had experienced that he included in his own work. So you'll see a lot of footnotes usually with Emerson. Emerson is usually characterized as being profoundly optimistic and I have heard some say he might be able to get you out of some sort of an identity crisis. Overall, a really brief look at trans transcendentalism will tell you that they saw human nature as divine, full of potential and full of possibilities. And we will see that in Emerson's work, human nature as divine, full of potential and full of possibilities. There were a number of transcendentalist writers in mostly New England in the 1840s or thereabouts. And Emerson was the most predominant. You have probably also heard of Henry David Thoreau. Um, other writers included Bronson Alcott, as in Louisa May Alcott, Little Women's Father, and also Margaret Fuller. But Emerson, he's really probably the most famous of them all. Thoreau's pretty, pretty close. Here's a breakdown of transcendentalism. The word itself, you see the word transcend sitting in there. To transcend is to go beyond. So the question might be, well, beyond what? Well, beyond understanding and knowing. Well, at least as it was understood at the time when Emerson was writing. Emerson was looking to take the idea of human understanding and knowing further than the ideas that we have seen with the brief summary of John Locke in this course. So John Locke put forward a belief in the mind as a receiver of sensory experience. So when we get to the idea of how knowledge is created and in the enlightenment, we see a lot of the writers emphasizing that through the senses people were experiencing the world and that that was how knowledge was created that idea of the belief in the mind as a receiver of sensory experience you might recall that i set that up as a reaction to calvinist and puritan thinking in american literary history because the mind wasn't seen as a receiver of sensory experience so much as a vessel of something that God had already put in motion, put in place, and that life and the afterlife were predestined, and that knowledge was written already by God. So the Enlightenment idea of the belief in the mind as a receiver of sensory experience, this idea right here, Locke's idea, is more freeing, more of an emphasis on the individual and on the self. But when Emerson began studying and writing and conducting his version of American philosophy, Emerson said, mm, instead of this, I believe something's missing from what Locke had to say. 
intuition is needed to feel a connection to something far greater. It's almost like something spiritual creeps back in, but it's in a very different form than what the Puritans or the Calvinists would have considered before the Enlightenment. Emerson would reject the idea of the tabula rasa, locks blank slate, the idea that people were born at blank slate and that they would go through life and that they would fill up their experience and knowledge through their sensory experience moving through life. Because Emerson said, no, 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 we're not blank at all, but we're connected and we're imbued with this inborn connectedness to nature, to one another and to the universe. And he even termed, he created this term, the oversoul. We're connected to this oversoul, the big soul that unites all of us. Well, there's some, there's some more behind this. Okay, so Emerson's idea of transcending and going beyond just understanding and knowing through sensory experience involves a great amount of trusting yourself. You see that not only in these two selections for this class, self-reliance and nature, but across Emerson's work. Emerson was a proponent of something called Neoplatonic idealism. That's a mouthful, okay, but Neoplatonic, Neoplato, Plato the philosopher, New Plato. He's taking what Plato said and he's reversing it. And Neoplatonic neo ideal, idealism, this is a tough concept, but the idea is that we can get lost in our sensory experiences. We can get lost if we don't have something else to supplement our experiences. We need something beyond just what we have in our perceptions. We need the spiritual. And Emerson may not have called it God, but it is very much a spiritual concept. All right, let's dig into self-reliance because these ideas, a lot of them, they make more sense when we apply the readings. Here are some of the greatest hits from Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Wow, love that idea. Like when you're reading something or when you're discovering something created by a genius, there's like this glimmer of recognition that you might have. And it's like your own rejected thought. So I guess there's this continuation that maybe if you didn't reject some of your thoughts, if you took some risks, you too could be this genius. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Well, that's one of the lines that has Emerson known for getting people out of an identity crisis. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Okay, we have to get past the gendered language of the 1840s, really the 19th century, and let's face it, most of the 20th century and even into today. Okay, so if we re rephrase this, it might say, whoso would be a person must be a nonconformist. In other words, if you want to be like a full individual person to your full potential, don't be a con don't conform, be a non-conformist. You must not conform. Don't follow the crowd. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. In other words, if you are just going along with the same thing over and over, that foolish consistently consistency, it's going to haunt your mind. You're not going to get very far. You're going to be just like a petty politician or an armchair philosopher or maybe a minister, but you're never going to get anywhere truly great. You're never going to be elevated to the level of genius unless you give up consistency. You have to be inconsistent. You have to be a non-conformist. And then this great line, to be great is to be misunderstood. And that's followed by another face. Uh, famous line when Emerson is saying um, Jesus was misunderstood and so on. And um, you'll see that in the reading. So when you read Emerson, there are a lot of lines like what's on this slide that pop out. 
it reads like a list of parables a lot of the time. Like he's highly quotable. If you fact, in fact, if you pause this right now and you go Google Emerson and you go to an image search, you're going to see quote after quote after quote after quote after quote. Emerson quotes galore online all over the place in um, sort of like little sayings that could be printed out and hung up on the wall, memes, that sort of thing. But it does make his writing choppy sometimes. And that choppy writing reflects how Emerson built his essays from his journals. He was a great journalist and he took these little nuggets from his writing and developed them into essays and speeches. And Emerson was, he was part of what's called the Lyceum movement. And the Lyceum movement, it was a, a trend to have public lectures. This was in New England and people who were highly educated, who were writers, who a lot of time famous authors, they would go and present lectures on a stage and they're kind of like, they were kind of like giving sermons in a way. So it really isn't that much of a stretch. And well, Emerson had training as a minister. It's not much of a stretch to read Emerson as this almost American type of religion. I assigned for our class self-reliance before nature, but self-reliance was actually written after nature. And I do think that it has a much more public facing feel to it. It's more accessible. It's still filled with that fragmentary writing, often non sequiturs, like one line doesn't seem to follow the one before it very well, and it may seem disjointed. That disjointedness, along with the high amount of intertextuality that large number of allusions can make Emerson a difficult read. All right, let's break down self-reliance a little bit more. Here's some basics. The individual is the spiritual center of the universe. You're also going to see that in the essay, Nature. Two main ideas, know thyself and also self-realization. Emerson here is going way beyond Ben Franklin with self-reliance, but he is Franklin's literary heir. So you can draw a direct line from Ben Franklin to Emerson and even to Thoreau. You'll be reading Thoreau's work soon. Self-reliance is a ready theme, a ready theme to follow throughout this class. We've seen it with Ben Franklin, even John Smith, Equiano. We've, we'll see it with Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass and many other readings in the course. Emerson's idea of self-reliance argues that the self in nature is autonomous, powerful, and free. Autonomous, powerful, and free. So this is a very democratic type of concept, very American. Now we have to pause for a minute. Anytime um, a generalization like that comes out of my mouth, I have to stop and say, okay, hold on a second. For whom, right? Because not everyone in America at the time was free. Emerson was writing during a time at which there were a large number of people in America who were in the system, an institution of slavery. Emerson was anti-slavery and he wrote about it. So I think when we read about Emerson's beliefs in freedom and liberty, we can map the idea of um, that freedom and liberty being available to enslaved people onto what Emerson was writing more than we could looking at, say, Thomas Jefferson. Often the literature, as with Emerson's essays that you read, literature, um, stories even, dramas, plays, all sorts of novels involve the conflict of the individual versus the system. And you can even see that in Emerson's writings. Self-reliance is sort of academic and educational and intellectual as a declaration of independence sort of writing about the self because Emerson was rebelling against academic notions that were European and he saw himself very deliberately fashioned himself as an American prophet. Now, a lot of times readers 
my students even will read him and say, this guy, I mean, this guy, he's so arrogant, you know, he's so full of himself. Okay, fine. But, but, but he is definitely one of the most prominent figures in all of American literary history. He does make a lot of people feel uplifted. He is um, considered an American philosopher and he is, well, as I mentioned earlier, highly quotable. Iterations of Emerson are throughout our culture, including um, some, just a couple examples here on the screen. One of these is from a media selection. And that idea um, of trusting yourself, these are two quotes here that go with it. Um, one was already in the slides, trust thyself, every heart vibrates to that iron string. And here's that, that continuation of the to be great is to be misunderstood. Is it so bad then to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood and Socrates and Jesus. To be great is to be misunderstood. Emerson lends himself to political thinking. Um, a lot of his writing has more overt politics in it than what the samples are that we're doing in this class. But in Self-Reliance, you will see him writing about the poor and relief societies. And he also writes, and here's, I'll just read a quote from Self-Reliance. If you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, vote with a great party, either for the government or against it, spread your table like base housekeepers. Under all these screens, I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are. In other words, you're 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 nothing if you're just kind of going through life robotically, going to church that with, without feeling, without um, contributions to society, voting just kind of blandly, without really thinking about what you're doing. Then you're not really living at all. I'm going to transition now to Emerson's essay, Nature. This is 1836. Written before self-reliance, as I mentioned um, a moment ago, nature, the um, the essay Nature, is it's a difficult read, which is one of the reasons why for the perusal I have uh, the just highlighted the parts that I thought were the most important to focus on. Here's a breakdown of some of the main ideas in nature. All true knowledge comes from nature. You have the transcendentalist ideals here that the individual is the spiritual center of the universe, the idea to know thyself and self-realization. So you can even see some repeats there from self-reliance that show up in the essay nature. So Emerson was traveling around New England, giving these essays as speeches. And he was part of the movement of American Romanticism. It's important to know that Emerson's writings do not promote a Christian view of God. He was a minister early in his career, but he left the organized church because he didn't believe in the doctrine. He saw spirituality as something more than what the church could give him. Transcendentalism has to do with transcending, right? Going beyond, as I defined a moment ago, transforming the self and becoming one with God, nature, the universe, the world, all beings. We could take na nature, the essay, and outline it. I have this on a couple of slides. It has eight parts and the essay has a structure to it. It seems to be built as an argument. It seems to have a sequence, but a lot like parts of self-reliance, it's interchangeable. You could take pieces of the essay and move them around and it, it would still work. Let's take a look at the outline. Nature first has an introduction. The human individual is bound by the past and social expectations and is therefore unsatisfied. That's a really brief overview of what he says in the introduction. Then he goes into the first segment which he calls nature. And in this part, he says, okay, nature is an extension of the self, but be careful not to see nature as what he gets into as part two. Don't see nature as commodity. 
If we see nature as a satisfaction for appetites, we should be careful and instead see beauty. Don't look at nature as something that's going to serve appetites, like cutting, just cutting down trees for wood or buildings or for the land to farm. We need to see nature as number three, beauty, this third section of the essay. And see nature as beauty and inspiring aesthetic delight. We should look at nature for its beauty. And people want to express beauty with language, the fourth section. He writes about language. People want to express beauty with language and establish a symbolic relationship between the human and the natural world. And Emerson spends some amount of time writing about how language actually is inadequate to access the truth which is really interesting if you put Emerson up against linguistics. So my students who are focusing on linguistics, pay attention to the fourth section of nature. You might find something interesting there that overlaps with determinism and language. In other words, how much of our thought is controlled by the words that we use, like we're trapped almost by our word choices because our ideas and words aren't exactly the same. But Emerson says, okay, well, we try to use language to get at beauty and that there is a symbolic relationship between the human and the natural, which, expire, which inspires a desire for discipline. Number five, the fifth section of nature, discipline, leading to the realization that nature is a unifier and in a space between humans and idealism. Okay, so nature is actually between, almost picture this like um, um, maybe on a ladder or something that, or you could do the, you could do it sideways too. You have people and then nature and then the ideal. I think I kind of like it going up and down like a ladder because you'd have idealism up near the top and um, then beneath that, you'd have people and nature is in between. Idealism is the understanding that there's something beyond nature. And this is where Emerson needs spirit. He needs to bring in the mystical. He needs to bring in his religious concepts. Nature, there's something even beyond it. Nature taps into the mystical, the spiritual, and it's the mystical that makes possible prospects, his eighth chapter. Prospects for reformulated or maybe even reformed humanity and society built on an idealistic model. In other words, if people can access this great spiritual realm through their connections with nature through using their language then they can reform society emerson's ideas they're built on the enlightenment emphasis on empirical investigation like using the senses to know the world but he says when you really want to surpass and understand the ultimate in the universe and the, I don't know, I guess like go to the meaning of life, ontological considerations. You need the spiritual, you need some sort of revelation too, but his revelation is not Christian. What's revealed isn't a Christian sort of revelation. It's something else. All right. These are heavy and difficult concepts. So I'm going to keep building on it. And I think it'll make more sense when we keep putting it all together. Here's Emerson's main ideas. There's a section where he writes about the idea of the not me. It's near the end of the introduction. And here Emerson is saying nature is everything but his mind. Even his body is nature. So the mind is separate from nature. All the rest of a person is just an add on to the mind. 
hair color, gender, eye color, shape, size of a person, nationality, their sex. In other words, when you look in the mirror, your reflection isn't yourself. That's not you. The soul is the only part of yourself that is your real self. So this idea of the not me near the end of the introduction, he's separating out the idea of the true self or the, like the inner soul of a person from basically everything else. And that even your own body is of nature. And so you have your soul and then you have nature as something separate. Probably the most famous scene of all famous passage in all of Emerson maybe even in all of transcendentalism is what I'm going to call the transparent eyeball scene. And I have the little cartoon explanation that goes with that. The, the transparent eyeball scene, when Emerson says he walks out onto the bare common, which is basically like going out into um, like a little grassy area between houses. He walks outside of his house and he turns into a transparent eyeball. So he's seeing out into the world and the world is also seeing in and through him. And it might even, there might be some reflection going on there too. And it's Emerson's great moment of revelation and transformation. There's an emphasis on transformation. This is again, a hallmark or a tenet of romanticism. Emerson writes in nature that creativity stems from beauty. And he writes a lot about art and the artist, which are, these are um, ideas that are connected to this, this greater, this greater being, this greater way of experiencing life, this connectedness that we all have to one another, to nature and to what's beyond nature, this, large oversoul. And he's saying that the single, like a single item, like a pine cone or something, he even mentions pine cones, corresponds to a larger whole. And that people look for relationships and objects and even language is metaphorical. So there's a lot of emphasis on symbolism in Emerson. And so your pine cone is symbolic of some larger relationship to the tree, the tree to the forest, to the forest in the world. And, and science actually does unlock a lot of these ideas for us. And we know more, much more even than Emerson's time in Emerson's time about correspondences. And he, and he writes about analogies as well. And his emphasis on analogies, it does the same kind of work where he's making comparisons. To get at the idea of correspondence is what I'm calling correspondences. Emerson writes about this idea that we recognize beauty. Sometimes when we see something beautiful, there's like this flash of recognition we have. And he says, that's our moment of tapping into a larger being, this larger soul that we're all connected to. Okay, last but not least for this slide, I just want to point out, don't miss the Shakespeare section. <laughs> There's this little detour into Shakespeare in Emerson when he he's trying to pull together different ideas. All right, sorry about the fuzziness of the image. It was the best I could do with this, but I wanted to dig into the idea a little bit more, a tough concept in Emerson of idealism with the idea of noumena and phenomena. These are terms that are often they're going to show up in philosophy classes and the little sketch you see here, the, the noumenal is the material world and it's real and unknowable. And that is connected through understanding to the phenomenal world, which is in the world of, of thought or the world of the mind. So what is the difference between the noumenal and the phenomenal world? So the phenomenal world, the one of the mind, that's why it's in the little thought bubble. It's the world that we're aware of. It's the world that we know that we construct in our minds out of the sensations that we have. And so we each walk around through life, going through life with our own mental worlds. 
presented to us. Like we give them to ourselves through our own senses. Mm. There, there's a lot of philosoph philosophical debate over the summaries I'm doing here, but um, so we, we create in a lot of ways, we create the world out of our own mind. Now the noumenal world, the material world consists of things that we, we feel like we believe in, but we can't ever really, we can't ever really know. There are some things that we can touch and filter through our perceptions, but there are a lot of things that are, that are beyond our understanding. Even if you don't grasp this all the way, the basic idea of it that I want you to contemplate is that Emerson is saying that there, there is something beyond the material world that we live in and that we have our perceptions, our own mental world that we live in as well, but that there's more out there beyond our own mental worlds, that there are pure forms. This is actually where it gets into the ideas of Plato and Platonic ideals, that there's some sort of pure form in nature of a concept. The, the go-to um, idea for this when people talk about Plato is the famous example of a chair. So the Platonic ideal example would, Plato would say, we have a chair in, in this room that we could sit on. And that chair is representative of some sort of ideal chair out there, I don't know, in space somewhere, right? This ideal chair. And we have this chair sitting here in the room that we might go sit on. How much chairness does that chair in the room have? How much does it get close to this ideal chair? And is the chair in your mind the same as the chair in my mind? And what about the color blue? Is your blue the same color I see in my mind when I think of the color blue? Or is there some sort of ideal blue out there in the world? None of these are exactly easy thoughts. Um, I want you again to just to understand that Emerson's trying to say, we're separate from the world and we filter everything through our perception, but with access to the spiritual, with access through nature to the spiritual, we can get at something beyond where we are. We can get to something closer to the ideal. We can get to what he later calls in essays, the oversoul. That each soul is connected to a higher, larger soul. This goes along with that idea of correspondences or analogies that Emerson makes, like making comparisons. And it connects to the idea of the sublime as well, the awe inspiring visions of nature that romantic writers were so enthralled with. There's overlap with what Emerson says about the mind of a child, that a child's mind is closer to the pure and closer to the ideal. Emerson often writes about how we should think more like children and also remember. He actually writes about it as remembering, which I think is really interesting, some divine connection to creation. As though, as though people have forgotten it somehow through the lens of what they learn moving through life. One of the most famous lines in, in nature is near the end, a man is a God in ruins. And I, I like that idea. And I like ending with that idea for nature because Emerson has really taken the, the Christian belief from Calvinism, the Puritan way of religion, the belief, the Christian belief that heaven was the most real thing of all. And the world was something that couldn't approach the ideal and said, you know, the world, the world contains nature. Nature is symbolic. Nature represents something beyond it. And if we can tap into nature, we can get insight into ourselves. And then from there, we can connect into this large concept of all of us being connected, 
all of our souls through this idea of what he called the oversoul. Thanks for watching.